Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this afternoon's first panel. Uh, uh, please excuse us for just running a little bit late. Uh, we have four fascinating presentations, and the protocol will be more or less um, that uh, each of our presenters will uh, take about 20 minutes, which is fairly disciplined, and then we'll take a few questions after each presentation. And uh, if we end, uh, you know, if we have any time left, we, we would welcome a further discussion, but we may have to end at that point uh, so that uh, the next session can take place roughly um, as scheduled. Although I've heard since we are starting a bit late, we have an extra 15 minutes to, you know, to add to our two hours. Uh, by the way, I'm Marcia Hermsen from uh, Loyola University up on the north side. I'm simply the chair. And we're going to have very minimalistic introductions so that we can have maximal time uh, for our uh, presenters. So um, the, uh, the topic of the session is music and sublime across the Muslim world. Our first presenter is Bertie Kibria, Sufi Takva, the sound and space of mystical song in Bangladesh. trace the course of uh, Bengali Muslim identity as it has uh, shaped the contours of regional poetry and performance, taking into account an array of sociocultural and aesthetic forces. In the latter half of my talk, I will turn to uh, the musical and dramatic significance of a Sufi sound in traditional Bangladeshi song today. And I'll describe the, describe the manner in which a number of lyrical styles merge to find relevance in a live and extemporaneous performance environment that is built on multiple layers of religiosity. I argue that uh, Sufism is not simply the inverted paradigm of Islamic orthodoxy or a singular expression of Bible, but an idiom which reflects a prism of incongruous yet, inco yet coexisting devotional rhetorics. In other words, a certain channeling, a certain sublimation of the sublime that's happening. Uh, Bengali Muslim heritage is often described as having insular origins, and that the indigenous belief system and poetic outpouring of this community from the pre-modern era onwards, has been constantly at odds with the empires that rule over the region, while such a statement trivializes the complex thought processes which have influenced Bengali Muslim poetry and song. It nonetheless remains factual that many of the early Islamic states in Bengal were founded by rulers of Persian, Turkic, or Afghani descent. In later centuries, the Mughals annexed the region or promoted a courtly Islam different from the Bengali Muslim worldview, while the East Indian Company and later the British Raj initially made their capital at Kolkata, in the heart of Hindu Bengal. The Bengal Renaissance, a sociocultural and religious reform movement which developed in the 18th and 19th centuries, was primarily instigated by the Hindu literati and deeply situated in their intellectual and cosmopolitan pursuits, propagating a modern Bengali literary style, which also impacted early campaigns for Indian nationalism. While Muslim writers also engaged with the Bengali Renaissance, East Bengal the region um, which is typically ascribed um, as being Muslim. East Bengal as a whole simultaneously underwent a very different kind of revivalism. Muslim reformers were making the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca in larger numbers at this time, bringing back with them the solemn and literalist views of Islamic conservatism from the region of Islam. Yet another layer of communal identity was shaped by the language movement, what's called in Bangla, Hasha Andal, a campaign which promoted solidarity through Bengaliness for which Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh today, uh, was center stage. This language-oriented and largely secular operation was kindled by the failures of Pakistani rule, its remote and partisan governments of East Bengal from the other side of India, but especially its official affirmation of Urdu as the common language of both Pakistans. Distraught by the Muslim-Muslim politics, which has sullied their relationship, 
and the relevance of implementing a link language just, such as Urdu on a nation of overwhelmingly being all these speakers. Those involved in the language movement would advocate a profound humanism that would fuel the independence movement for Bangladesh in the early 1970s. By the 1990s, and despite never officially being an Islamic republic, Bangladesh witnessed a strong emergence of Islamic politics in Parliament, primarily through the oppositional BNP party, whose rise to power was enhanced by an elite alliance with certain Islamic parties, which spiritually acknowledged constituents throughout the small towns and villages of Bangladesh, the vast majority of whom were the Muslims. As recently as 2013, however, and this is an ongoing struggle, the Shabbat protests erupted in Dhaka, calling for the complete ousting of the jamaat e islami the country's foremost Islamic party, from national politics, while also demanding capital punishment for the most eminent members of the jamaat considering them to be long-standing conspirators and supporters of Pakistani rule. It goes without saying that this diasporic pietism, as well as transglobal and virtual movement, have further complicated the relationship between language, religion, and space in Bangladesh. On the one hand, te technological advances, socioeconomic developments through microfinancing in rural Bangladesh, an expanding middle class and immense private sector growth, and a burgeoning folk revivalism have all had great impact on the development and propagation traditional music performance whose continued evolution cannot simply be mapped onto an urban rural dichotomy. On the other hand, the separate development of Bengali Hindu and Bengali Muslim intelligentsias in the modern era and their respective endeavors in promoting ethnic nationalism and religious reform have subsequently affected the ways in which gentrified devotional song has entered, has generated rather, lingering hegemonic musical tropes in the Bengali psyche. Thus, while there's a certain rural romanticization of the urban, as well as an urban romanticization of the rural, of the, their coalescence in the sprawling megacity of Dhaka, the country's single metropolitan center, suggests more nuanced teleologies at play. To look at this question more broadly, it's first useful to briefly assess the aesthetic legacies of mystical song in contemporary Bangladeshi culture. Mysticism and song are intertwined with the development of the language, and some of the earliest specimens in proto Bengali are esoteric poems set to very specific ragas, very specific melodic modes. Much of the pre-modern literature of Bengali Muslims made critical headway in translating Persian Arabic romances into Bengali, as well as in incorporating Sufi metaphysical concepts into a distinctive Bengali environment. The vast majority of these works were lyrical, set to prosodic patterns, and some would contribute to a secondary body of sacred literature for the developing Muslim community. In the 18th and 19th centuries, however, the emergence of localized mystic songwriters became prevalent in Bengal, and today they are collectively memorialized as the architects of Bhav Shongit, the enduring tradition of mystical song in Bengali, which spans various cultural milieu, regional districts, and theological orientations. While many of the saint poets belonging to this tradition were clearly Sufi in methodology, they were officially indoctrinated into Sufi brotherhoods and promoted a certain style that we can identify as such. They were not all predominantly so, nor Muslim for that matter. Certainly, we can make a general correlation here with the matter in which Hindu Hakri and Muslim Sufi poets from North India are conjured in popular culture and belonging to an overarching mystical framework. But in the case of Hashemi, its repertoire is indicative of a loose network of poetic dispositions and musical streams, which are both consciously and more subliminally indexed by groups of contemporary musicians in Bangladesh who perform in Sufi environments. First, I turn to some of the poets themselves. Um, so this is just a diagram um, that talks, uh, categorizes some of the uh, more important poets in the Bhavshan Deep tradition, Mustafa Sal tradition in Bengali, according to certain general categories. And I'm using the word Tattva here, in Bengali is pronounced Tattva, which just means an essence or principle. Um, so you have Deho Tattva, which are songs that are specifically concerned about the body, and the body is a microcosm of discussing the cosmos. You have Prem Tattva, songs about love. So I've, I've organized some of these different Tattva or Tattva into different categories and named some of the particular um, artists uh, in these sort of contexts and how they would categorize the legacies of these poets to fall under certain topics. Uh, notably, nearly every pop show composition ends with something called a Bonita, which is a lyrical in which the poet's own pen name is inserted into the last line of verse. And this musical signature authenticates the piece while also allowing it to be used by an artist who sings the song for juxtapositional effect. Through the poems, Bonita, an author's view or spiritual disposition is conjured, which can then function as a dramatic device in mystical performance. 
In fact, this poetic stamp is not specific to Bengali poetry, but is found in the Hindu devotional Panjab hymns of North India, the Kathi poems in Punjabi and Sindhi, the Urdu Hadal, connected further to Persian poems of Hafiz and the Turkish poems of Yusuf. Thus, while these poems offer a historic snapshot of writers' intellectual inclinations or socio-cultural environments, the compositional style itself is fully conscious of the great compendium of mystical song from poets' past, while continuing to function as a broad palette for modern musicians who seek parts <coughs> and their power. <coughs> Next, I turn to a number of streams in the optional tradition, musical streams. Uh, this is a very guide that I've used. Uh, for various uh, genres of Hindu devotional song, the first stream, there is an emphasis on a leisure, leisurely written progression in the triple as opposed to duple meters that are commonplace in Bengali. But an emphasis on, that is also on the many regional aesthetic traditions which have long interacted with the larger Indian devotional philosophies in East, East India, particularly through Vaishnavism. The latter has produced an enigmatic devotional style that ponders over the slow and arduous task of meditation and emphasizes a strong attachment for corridor or bodily metaphysics. Secondly, Urdu based song forms have long existed in Bengal. In Bengali. Uh, the country's national poet, Ghazi Nazrul Islam, endeavored to create the Bengali Muslim art music, which also incorporated the authoritative imagery found in Urdu poetry and through it the classical themes of Persian Arabic mystical literature from a modern song form. While Hindustani and North Indian classical music has traditionally been the musical proclivity of Hindu communities in Bengal, and especially the expositional vocal style of Drupad and Kea, it is important to note that the classical, a classical musical style entered the Bengali Muslim imaginary in the form of light classical song and through Urdu based song forms such as the Urdu Ghazal and Kalali. A third musical stream, the folk music of Bangladesh, provides a more regional flair to the formal structure of Pahajan, blending the stock motifs of folk melodies and melismatic vocal delivery, and localized heterophonic instrumentation of the Dotara lute, Basuri flute, and Ho drum. This musical stream also evokes the landscape and life of pastoral Bengal, traditional laborers, domestic affairs, seasonal moods, communal celebrations, which serve as an allegorical corridor to broader discussions of love, devotion, and human existence. Fourthly, the main varieties of vernacular theater that exist in Bengal have also been influenced how Mahab Shongit is enacted on stage, demonstrating a penchant for dialectical and discursive performance, a histrionic delivery style involving song and recitative, and interaction with the live audience in an open air environment. A fifth musical stream suggests a link to Bengali Sufism's key fascination with song poetry in the form of erudition and scholarly exegesis. Notably, the pioneering poets of this tradition were saintly lyricist scribes. Their literary outpouring, outpouring was as much speculative as it was bibliographical, bibliographical, perhaps drawing on the rich traditions of ancient manuscript writing in South Asia, as well as the theologians of classical Islam, um, which promoted intellectual Sufism. Music's ambivalent place in certain uh, musical societies has had its own repercussions amongst the Bengali Muslims, and an attachment to scripture and the word has remained critical. Musically, this is manifested by a referential nod to the printed word as a form of authentication. For example, Boyaki artists in Bangladesh, in addition to, be, in addition to being Sufi practitioners and contracted performers, are often avid book collectors and even resort to writing down polemical points with pen and paper whilst engaged in staged musical debates with other the artists. And lastly, a prominent community of mystics in Bengal, the Baal community, have left an indulgent mark on mystical, on mystical song performance. A collection of aesthetics and musicians who emerged as early as the 15th century, the Baal community's poetic and sonic building blocks are themselves a musical pastiche, yet their compositions have produced a canonic tradition of their own further nuanced by their formidable place in the Bengali consciousness through the heavy promotion, as one of uh, Bengal's, indeed South Asia's, exemplary folk music communities. Idiosyncratic vowel instruments reinforce the austere and emotion-laden qualities of the vowel sound, droning overtones, highly syncopated strumming patterns, and punctuating almost melodic percussion. Throughout Bengal, mystics and musicians deferentially refer to themselves as vowel, even if they're not indoctrinated into this tradition which is perhaps most evidential of their pervasive influence, which includes a sort of musical asceticism that dictates the etiquette of a fakir. In order, to buy, in order to provide a more detailed example of how these poets and stylistic streams interact, in my remaining time, I return to a specific group of Sufi musicians in Bangladesh, the, the Boyati community. 
This is uh, a video still of a Boyaki musician, Abdul Hai uh, Dewan. The casually referenced Boyaki has been frequently con conflated with a, a more deeply situated otherness. Underlying the dilemma of the Boyaki community is their lack of a specific style of song as canonic bass, which seems to have changed with the conditions of their milieu, as, they have, as their identities as mystics or purveyors of style. As a result, the meager literature on Boyaki on Boyakis consist of historic studies of a specific genre rather than on the community itself. Yet, the metamorphic qualities of Boyaki song, which has perhaps allowed this community to be misapp misapprehended through decades of obscurity, is simultaneously the catalyst behind their creativity. In fact, the Boyaki community has never endeavored to define themselves to others on specific theological or musical grounds, rather they have focused on being heard and being relevant, perhaps to the detriment of their own communal distinctiveness. A Boyaki is typically indoctrinated into one of two Sufi brotherhoods, the Chishti or the Qadari. The Chishti Brotherhood, unique to South Asia in this development, brings to Boyaki culture a readily acknowledged set of ritual practices and related body of popular saint figures known throughout the Indian subcontinent. Chishti hagiography and conventions help to legit legitimate Boyaki performance through this familiarity and are thus wrapped in the trappings of Sufi mysticism. Qadari leadership, on the other hand, situated in the larger expanse of the Muslim world, is more decentralized, and each century in the Muslim world has more freely adopted their own interpretations and practices. This type of administrative structure mirrors the Boyaki community's organization as a loose coterie of bars. The, uh, today, Boyakis engage in the popular style of, the, of performance known as Bichar Dan. This is uh, some audience members watching Bichar Dan. Typically, the Boyakis, the two Boyakis that are in the debate will sit on stage. A uh, square sort of shaped stage, and the audience is in concentric circles around them. So, bichar and the word bichar means deliberation, so songs of deliberation. Uh, this is a ple very polemically driven genre of song and narrative uh, recitation, largely staged in the improvised and open air spaces of Sufi shrines. Funded by Muslim committees, regulated by communal judges, and enjoyed by connoisseurs and passers by, bichar dan allows two boyaki musicians. To alternatively take the stage and partake in a dialectical display of artistry based on prearranged and binary topics of discourse. These are some BCD covers. I don't have a time in my presentation to talk about what happens to this live debate when it becomes commodified uh, in the studio. Um, but here are some various debate topics that you might see in the Bichat Dhamma Two larger performance circuits bring the textual shape to the contemporary Boyaki stage. One such circuit involves a route of moving artists that regularly perform at large open air venues during the cooler and drier months between Dulva Puja and the monsoon season. If this first circuit is a collection of mobile artists, the second refers to stationary edifices, the larger array of Sufi shrines in Bangladesh, and the many pilgrimage networks which are shaped by them. In these popular points of congregation, congregational and individual experience, the broad spectrum of religiosity amongst Bengali Muslims can be readily observed. Some mausoleums are large complexes funded by national endowments. Others are little more than dilapidated relics in the countryside. Some advocate the orthodox beliefs of the mainstream. Others are detached from nearly every aspect of conventional Muslim piety. The many routes of pilgrimage connect to these shrines are correspondingly complex, competing with one another with the spectacle of liturgical service, music making, commodified paraphernalia, and their popularization through specific performances and media forms. A mutual advantage benefits the shrine cultures who hold Bichar Dhan debates and the Boyaki artists who perform them. On the one hand, the typical shrines which patronize this musical debate fall outside the purview of major shrine centers, and Boyaki performance becomes an important source of revenue and promotion. On the other hand, the uninstitutionalized Boyaki artist receives a certain artistic legitimacy and creativity in this shrine environment, where different shrines within the circuit promote different types of debate topics and newly erected shrines, which are always happening in Bangladesh, hire Boyaki artists to aid in envisioning a suitable musical ambience. The death of famous Boyaki artists, too, become points of musical convergence for the Bichar Dhan debate. Um, what I've done in this uh, diagram is just to divide um, some of the different types of melodies that Boyaki refer to when they're in the process of composition. Um, and so I put these under a different it's not important to know the names of the melodies, but they fall into different different categories here. The Boyaki community are themselves a living repository of optional compositions, having a thorough appreciation for the mystical song tradition in Bengali, but are also important composers and lyricists in their own right. 
you can go back to music musicianship. It's just a number of stock melodies, a combination of original and borrowed motifs, which are shaped by the aforementioned streams of musical influence. So now in the concluding two minutes, I'm just going to play a musical uh, example or two. by Abdul Hamid, the doyen of Bolaki poets in the 20th century. This song illuminates on Bach Pantanan, the five volumes of popular image found in Sufi and Shia discourse, which refers to the figures of Muhammad, his righteous successor, Imam Ali, Ali's wife and daughter, the Prophet Fatima, and their two sons, Imam Hassan and Hussein. The song's symbolic incorporation of Bach Pantanan, however, explores a deeper correlation within the divinity within the body through the five senses and the correlation within the five as well as an inverse correlation with the Indic concept of the five personified thieves, which disrupt meditation, lust, anger, greed, attachment, and pride. In Bengali, we refer to as Kam, Pro, Lo, Mo, and Ahamkar. This exists in a number of other Indian traditions as well. The Sikh version, for example, also refers to this concept. Furthermore, Montaz Begum, the singer, uh, her interpretation of the song is situated in the Vijayagran debate. In this case, a debate known as Nu Akar which deliberates on whether the, the divine presence emerged from primordial light or assumed physical manifestation. Re regarding light, the singer Montaz, a female boy the artist, uses the opportunity to offer a more gendered musical exposition. First, the song's author, Abu Hani, is widely credited for promoting female disciples on stage, an incident he helped in pioneering a new debate style known as Nani Purush, which debates the, the merits of men versus women. Like in Kwak Pandatan, to primordial light, the composer Abdul Halim says in the song, it floats through the air, carried by the wind. It rises from the formless void. Secondly, the rendition heard here by Mongaz is set to a melody known as Ram Prashad Shul, a well-known tune popularized by 18th century poet Ram Prashad Shen, who belonged to the tradition of Shakti discourse, discourse within Bengali Hinduism, which interprets primordial cosmic energy to a feminine creative power embodied by the mother goddess. I'm just going to play a Ram Prashad Shul from a historic portion. So it's the same, it's the same melody. That's the, the point I'm trying to hear. So her, in, a, in her accompanying commentary, Montaz, the singer, is further inspired by this association between poet Abdul Hadi and melodist Ram Shah Shen by serving the pervasively feminine nature of light and creation in this discussive, in this cursive performance. The processes of thematic, poetic, and melodic borrowing, which are widespread in pop show and composition, can be found in many other forms of South Asian music today. This is neither a simple nor always deliberate borrowing, but a habitual compositional phenomenon which suggests that the individual elements of a musical piece are themselves neither mutable objects nor sole possessions of a phenomenon standard. The legacies of great thing the poets and musicians, from Rabindranath Tagore to Lalo and Shai, have often been exempted uh, from this type of scrutiny, their towering identities ennobled by the impulse to codify and immortalize. But regarding musical sources of inspiration, a Boyaki singer once told me, When the heart is stirred, the body and the pen keep dancing. Uh, we can take a couple of uh, questions. We're, our protocol is we'll allow a couple of questions after each presenter, but we'll be rather strict about the time. So does anyone in the audience want to uh, raise a point right now? Otherwise, <laughs> we, if we don't have questions right now, we can collectively. Yeah, I'm just interested in having spent time in the early Pakistan in the 60s. Is there any residue of the, of the East Pakistan history, cultural or anything that you know that was uh, aided the, the 
Si parla di un po' di una politica. Pensiamo che non si c'è solo già. I mean, I think music did definitely very differently some lingering elements. Um, I, I mentioned very briefly, and I know I showed a number of slides too quickly, but, um, uh, you know, one of, there is a, there, you know, Udu poetry, and particularly about that in Karan, we have a long tradition in Bengali music, which dates way back to before the formation of Pakistan. In the 20s and 30s, um, educated Bengali Muslims sort of enthusiastically learned Udu, thinking that mm -hmm. it was a language that they ought to know because it it, um, you know, it, was, it had reflected a much more deeper connection to the Islamic world. That changed in the 1950s with the language movement, but it still remains in the songs. And there are other traditions in Bangladesh where you see uh, there's another Sufi brotherhood in Bangladesh in, in, in the southeast corner of the nation called uh, Maj Anna. It's a particular area of Bangladesh, and there's a very specific indigenous Sufi brotherhood there. And they compose songs even today in Bengali and Urdu. Yes. Just one quick observation yes. at the, the conclusion of your talk about uh, the fact that uh, musical motifs, thematic motifs, verses are not reified and um, viewed as uh, the possession of one individual but are mm -hmm. constantly being uh, 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 reinstituted in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fascinating discussion for all of those who, like me, consider Bob Dylan to be our best as a performer <laughs> and composer, where he talks about this very issue because he's been accused of taking stuff from different people. And he gives examples of folk songs and then his own songs and says how having these folk songs in his mind brought out this new song. And I think anyone, if you, anyone looks it up on the um, uh, Music Share Award, you can find that discussion. It's actually quite specific. And I think it's a way of, I just thought I'd bring that up to well, uh, show that the importance of this idea and the way it works. Thank you for your comment. And I should put a lot of faculty in the room at the music department, Steve Rings, who actually works on this very topic. Um, it's currently writing. Oh, I think so. Marty, thank you very much. Um, and I want to follow up a bit on, on, on Michael's point here. You 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 close talking about the, the ways and a sort of synthesis actually, a kind of a sharing of the network of of of, 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 of you know, song culture. Um, and then you compare that with the sort of the, the your Bauchongit streams. And and the the question I, I have is that you're suggesting a little bit that the streams are flowing more in one direction than toward the Vyatis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet they depend on the English and, 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 and in other in other zones out there. How much of the flow that you're talking about is moving in the other direction? To what extent is it exchange? Um, that that's the Yeah. So uh, this is a question that I'm interested in, um, particularly with, as it regards female Vyatis. Um, um, I'm not sure how concisely I can talk about female Vyatis because it's a huge vast topic, but uh, some, some of the Vyatis, uh, female Vyatis members have entered a much more larger musical mainstream. And um, it's interesting the ways in which they maintain or not maintain a Vyatis identity as they do this. Because I think what, what happens is um, when, you, when you go the other way back, uh, when, when Vyatis um, enter sort of the, the urban data based recording environment, other things come into play that affects um, the kinds of melodies or types of motifs that they might choose. For example, uh, there's been a, there's a long standing tradition in uh, in in Kuntaka that Bangladeshi, uh, that Muslim Bengali women have certain etiquette on stage. Um, but it's an etiquette which is used for the purpose of performing secular music, not music that is devotional, which is interesting. Um, and one of the reasons that exists, and it's because for a long time it wasn't really wasn't it sort of a standard and gentrified sort of thing on devotional music. And so when Boyakis enter this sort of industry, they have to realign certain motifs of certain songs that fit the more urbane listenership that they're dealing with. Um, I'm, I'm exploring this now with this particular artist and does they will. Thank you so much. Thank I think we're um, 
we may come back uh, to general questions, or you can contact Bertie privately if you, you um, have something else that you needed to ask. But in the interest of getting um, to our next session in time, I'd like to invite our second presenter, Shana Silverstein. Uh, she's from the Northwest School of Communication. Did I get the right question? Yeah, I love the street of Northwestern. Yeah, the street near Osceola at Northwestern. And um, her uh, topic is Performing Sacred Popular Syrian Sufi Dance as um, National Heritage. So we'll give Shane a second to, uh, to get set up here. religion and religious movements and politics and religion um, and more speak broadly you know, about um, the ways in which we embody and live and practice um, things which are spiritual. Um, but um, perhaps I you know, also need to consider ways in which sacred is in fact a translation um, and that might not um, necessarily apply. So thank you already for you know, so, um, a provocative um, warning. Um, so uh, the subject for today is um, Rasa Samach, a dance of listening and indeed focusing on the dance, um, and a dance that has become um, stage presented and commodified as, um, as folk dance, um, coming from uh, the term of the concept sha'ab uh, or sha'abiya um, in Arabic, uh, but also coming from the movement processes of folklorization um, that began in the 1930s, 1940s, and very much um, became part of Syrian national history as of um, the 1950s and 1960s. And this is really where this particular story um, begins. Um, the where, where this fits in within my um, larger project is um, actually rather parenthetical. So I thank you for the invitation to come speak today on something and actually give it the attention that it deserves. Um, if you will, Rafsa Smach is the fraternal twin of that which I spent most of my time thinking about, which is Debki, which is um, a, a rural um, wedding dance um, that is associated with secularism. Um, and um, Debki became, it's kind of the paradigmatic uh, performance tradition of Syria. Um, uh, but at the same time that it became um, a, a national dance, um, Ratsa Samah also became um, part of um, Syrian folk dance. And um, one of the um, iconic figureheads is this absolutely lovely lady here. Um, apologies for the crop. Um, that is how the image was given to me um, by her. Um, she is uh, Salma Qasim Hassan. Um, and she is um, performed in the very first uh, popular arts troupe, um, as it um, translates, um, Omaya. Um, she started as a young girl, um, started performing them at the age of 12, and her father um, had founded Omaya, so she joined us. And um, for Jay, and here she is, obviously, a little bit grown up from, from 12 years old, um, and um, obviously, um, her person is meant to be on stage, and she's very charming. 
in this, in this photo. Um, what we can also glean from this photo that speaks to what Rasa Samahan is about um, it is a very much a feminized dance. Um, one of, of the um, qualities most often used to describe it is lina, or soft. Um, and um, I'll speak more to this later. Um, but um, what that might be contrasted to in terms of um, the performance of, of, Sufi, of Sufism is something which we are perhaps more familiar with um, in terms of heritage practices and Sufism throughout Turkey and Syria and other places. Um, this um, um, is a quote from YouTube um, and is a video of a man performing as a ruling dervish um, at, a, um, at a protest, um, not in Syria. Um, music and dance and, and um, sacred traditions um, that, that are Syria, right? And also to show, um, just to close this with what Ras al Samah is about. Okay, so this came, comes from the same um, archival images um, that Salma Qasab Hassan provided me. Unfortunately, I don't have any information um, about um, uh, about when this photo was taken, or what sort of circumstances, or, or who these people are. Um, so, um, it's one of um, the, the, it's part of method, right? Um, especially working uh, in a place where Syria, but Syria, I think, are not often um, documented in an archive. Um, and, um, and as you can see here, um, again, um, it appears to be, um, in this case, um, women performers, right? Um, so. Um, so on stage is embodied in a feminine sense. Um, and as well, um, you have um, the doff um, as um, uh, signifying a visitor. Um, you also have um, lacy um, and embroidered um, clothing, um, which extant sources say is, is part of what this performance of Sufism, Rasa Sama, is about. So this is very much a sort of quintessential um, statement um, for um, um, uh, for for Ras al uh, The headdress as well um, uh, gives it more of a, a feminine um, sort of character, especially the way um, that um, the veil uh, drapes along the back. What is interesting is that this is a dance that accompanies or is accompanied by, and I want to kind of um, both, uh, I want to trouble that relationship, Muashahat um, and Kudud, which are the classical music traditions um, mostly associated with Aleppo and Holmes. And I would, in line with kind of the thinking behind this, this conference, uh, the provocative question of labor and whether the sublime is something that is material and what kind of efforts um, go through to, to make this possible. Um, I want to question how these dancers are embodying um, the work of Sufism, the work of the ecstatic and, and the role of the bodies. Um, and it's just that it is, in fact, these women who are um, 
doing the work of the labor of the sublime on stage as part of folk dance and is part of Syrian national patrimony. Um, and this plays into um, the larger sort of rubric for, um, for uh, Syrian nationalism um, as it um, played out from the, 19, the early 1960s um, until today. Behind that kind of thinking, I'm, I'm drawn on the work of Anthony Shea, um, who looks at choreographic strategies and um, the work of state-sponsored dance companies um, and how um, there are certain methods for analyzing power and representation within state folk dance companies. Um, through his term choreographic strategies, he identifies uh, various strategies used among dance companies and relate these to broader processes of colonialism and nationalism in order to suggest that certain histories, in this case we might say religious histories and ethnic identities, in this case we might say which Sufism becomes a sort of ethnic or uh, racialized identity, um, that are concealed and presented in the process of performing the nation through folk dance. Um, it's also a way to look at literally the technology of performance that is the dress, the props, the melodies, the um, choreographies um, through which uh, directors and choreographies um, stage authenticity or make claims towards authenticity um, and how they adapt movements from um, the field to the stage as well as considering uh, preservation, documentation, and archiving processes. For instance, we can see here in this um, same set of archival photos that the women are all in a circle. And um, the notion of Rasul Hamah as being circular um, is um, creatively played out throughout um, many different uh, productions. Um, sometimes in that all of the individuals come together to form a collective hoka or, or circle, sometimes in the rotation of a singular person, similar to a rolling dervish, and some other ways um, that we'll see later, basically. Um, what I'm trying to do here in this presentation is build towards a very specific event in order that we can then sit there and analyze and think about that performance event in, um, in light of, of the context that I'm trying to draw out now. So here we see um, the circle, we also see our movements, um, and those are very typical, basically, of lowering and raising one hand and then another in front of the chest, um, which is meant to be part of that softness that is part of, um, literally, you know, this kinesthetic part of the movement. Um, what we don't see here is footwork, which tends to be um, one foot moving in front of the other, similar to a whirling dervish um, that extant sources, um, particularly in the work of Adnan and Zareil, um, see as emblematic of, of Syrian Sufi dance, as that word. And here um, we have a little bit, you know, we see a little bit more of the, the wrist work, if you will, um, that, that often um, takes place. And you also notice a bit of a demure and modest quality um, that is also attributed, attributed to Rasa Sama. Um, other um, words that have been used to describe it in the few written sources that do try and talk about it, it are um, that it is grave, that it is sober, um, modest, dignified, um, all of which are in some ways um, very much in opposition to, for instance, Debki, which is um, extremely um, rhythmic and energetic. Um, and the one that got off. Um, um, I'd be actually interested to see to hear from you during the question and answer or question and discussion period um, if um, you've come across similar. Um, sorts of folk dance um, in, in other contexts. Um, I really feel like I've only come across, across it specifically to um, Lebanon and Syria. Um, 
and by Rafa Sama, I simply mean the staging of Sufi dance other than Roman dervishes. Um, so here um, is an example. Ramsey al Libby is a Lebanese American living in New York City, um, and here he's um, staged for production. strategic move that falls within the tradition of um, Washahat um, itself. And um, most likely most of you are familiar um, with Washahat, but to kind of to rehearse it, um, um, it is um, arrived to um, Aleppo and more broadly on Mashrik um, in the 12th century um, and is even till today um, from, sorry, to, from um, North Africa. And, and Lucia, and to today continues to connote an Andalusian um, imaginary uh, that does quite a lot of uh, productive work in and of itself. Um, it is a musical poetic genre, which you heard here was a, a, an instrumental form called the Samai, it's a, a 10 8 rhythm, um, but Mashahat is um, also a, a poetic, um, is poetry set to song um, with an orchestral or a furka um, accompaniment. And um, it uh, is very much a, a tradition of innovation in which people, um, participants, musicians, composers, um, continue uh, to uh, create material and find new ways of analyzing it that continue to give it life. For instance, a friend, a friend from um, Latakia, now based in New York, is writing a series of articles about improvisation within Washahat, um, which is um, a way of improvising both with analysis and writings and the music itself um, that you know, is um, you know, very much the way to participate in this canonic um, canonic tradition. Um, if you will, Mashahat is also the other paradigmatic performed tradition of Syrian, right? So it's um, extremely valorized. Um, and, um, 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 Jonathan, Jonathan Shannon has written um, just a very beautiful um, ethnography about um, um, Washa, and one of um, the claims that he makes is that he um, kind of sees it as a metaphor or in some ways a um, aesthetic model um, that um, derived from the Zikr. Um, and so if we consider that Washa had occurred in the form of a wasla or a suite of, of songs um, that have their own sort of um, progression, um, that this um, um, brings out um, the, the ritual event of the zikr such that participants um, end up feeling a um, state of ecstasy as well as a state of calm and peacefulness um, at the conclusion of uh, the wasla. I think that's incredibly important for how we might interpret Rasa Sama, given that this dance accompanies Mwashahat and Qadu. Um, 
the dude is um, often performed as part of a wassala. It's an urban light musical genre um, consisting of songs from across the region, from poems from Aleppo and, and Damascus, but it is primarily associated with Aleppo and is considered part of Aleppo heritage. Um, and um, so, and the dude is kind of, it happens at the end of the wassala as um, uh, um, after a lot of the, the work has been done, right? A lot of the more serious the listening um, has occurred in the Wesla, the, the, um, the, the couple and the cadence happens um, with this uh, light musical form called the um, Excuse me. Um, so, given this um, model of the zipper, um, what sort of, what can we make of Roxas Sama? And here's um, where I'll turn to the primary material um, I want to draw on. This is um, Adnan Abu Shema. Um, uh, well, what this actually is, um, Adnan Abu Shema, unfortunately, he uh, passed away a couple of years um, later due to uh, poor health. Um, and uh, he's performing with um, an orchestra uh, from Aleppo. Um, he himself is the, or was, the um, expert on Qudud, books on it, and so on and so forth. And uh, where this uh, concert is taking place is in Qasr al-Azam, in the old city of Damascus. Um, Qasr al-Azam, it used to be a, a, a Pasha's palace in the, the 19th century, um, and is now um, the site of the Museum of Popular Arts um, in the old city. And um, the Museum of Popular Arts is very much that non-ironic, kitschy space um, that um, presents uh, folk traditions as they were in terms of food, in terms of everyday life and customs, um, and it does so not only in terms of material objects but also in terms of um, musical and performance practices. Um, in term, it, it's in within um, the um, Geography of Damascus in the Old City, Qasr is located near to the Citadel where rural music festivals um, take place and is kind of more part of the, um, the grand official stage culture of the city as compared to other, um, like Baktum and Balsharki, which are parts of the Old City that you enter to simply go shopping or, or dine with your friends, a little bit more casual. Um, so the fact that this is taking, that this performance is taking place at this palace or this museum is um, also um, endowing it with that sort of national patrimony. It's very much um, in placing it as a heritage practice um, and with all the um, kind of top-down symbolism that that um, suggests. Um, so what we're going to see here is a folk dance group um, called Perkal Hamani, um, named after the director, um, that are going to uh, perform a, a program of Francis Ma to Kadud, uh, performed by the orchestra. Um, something to also note here is the orchestra is entirely male musicians, um, instrumentalists in Syria, um, with the exception of an all women's orchestra, um, is um, primarily a majority male. Um, on stage, we now have both men and women, as opposed to the 1960s photos I was showing. Now, uh, Rasa Sama is itself um, um, a um, multi gender.
of time. Um, this um, particular piece is, it goes on for about six minutes in entirety. Um, so I think it's not incidental that um, for Bahamari joined this particular concert at the end of the Basala, at the end of uh, the program um, for the Hudud um, um, uh, part of the program. Um, and what I think that suggests, and what my, my main point of, of how my um, interpreter would think of Rasa Samah is that the dancer performing Rasa Samah as I shows embody the state of peacefulness of Antimanam, that is the divine pursuit of a, of a, of a zikr. Um, and by embodying such peacefulness, uh, dancers do the work for the audience. Um, that is, they are vessels through which the audience feel as if they have accomplished divine work or subliminal labor of Sufis. Uh, this co-performative relationship between artists and audiences itself produces a sense of national patrimony or cultural heritage in which Sufi original movement is emblematic of Syrian nationhood. And um, if I had more time, I would go into the, the, the politics or the sort of um, identity relations that are then, um, by which we which by which Sufism then fits into um, hegemonic notions of Syrian nationhood um, in problematic ways. But um, here I think what we have is the sense that um, the projected sort of uh, um, ideal Syrian uh, citizen who is secular, right, and uh, sort of multi-ethnic, right, able to appreciate all of the different um, uh, ethnicities and religions that constitute Syria, can sit back and watch others represent um, the peacefulness of the work of, of the zipper um, and through that, um, yeah, through a very well performed heritage. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I think we have time for one or two questions, depending how long they are. Um, it's or we sort are. of, I'm sorry, we're up at this next time. Formulate your question in the So I wonder if you could point out to us the, you're making a, a claim for iconicity between the Zika and the mm -hmm. um, But looking at that dance, I don't see Zika. So, I wonder if you can point out or tease out somehow the, that ethnicity. Yeah, so uh, there seems to be a lot of gaps in how to um, frame Fats al Samah. It's um, not in the Syrian scholarship that I've looked at. Um, um, you know, it's identified as something that accompanies the Mashahad, as something that has religious origins and should be practiced in as pure a way as possible. You know, um, um, and or something that's just very Syrian in nature, what that means. Um, and um, so I, the kind of my thought processes for how to attach it um, to the zipper are to to say that it um, it is unique among folk dances as an in its stage version, um, as being accompanied by classical music. Right, um, Debki is, is accompanied by, um, actually it's not music, you know, it's um, song, sounds, popular sounds and rhythms. Um, Roxa de Swania, like women's dance, which is like, Rox Sharky, like looks a little bit like um, um, adaptive belly dance, um, is accompanied by um, pop, and, you know, their, their songs like and Um And so, so being that so closely tied from Washa Hot, um, and that it is um, understood as being a Sufi-derived dance. Mm -hmm. and that, is, that is very clear. It, is, um, it represents Sufism in Syria, um, within um, staged versions of Syria. Um, uh, 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 that's how. Mm -hmm. okay. Then I kind of made a leap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And is, is it the music that's, that has those uh, associations? Is that the music? I think, they, the I think they also intend for the dance to um, to stage the zikr. Um, I, I don't. I think there's. I think part of you know a lot of the arm movements and the sachets across stage. You know, it's it's carried. There's a lot of uh, the dance, you know, the call, a lot of um, that. That comes from um, the history of dance within Syria and and how um, you know performers become trained 
um, and what um, choreographers have, have done, and, that's, it's, it, and that it also falls from a certain genealogy of these folk dance troops and the choreographers, um, so that what you see on the stage is as much referring to the um, authentic ethnographic origin, right, of Sufi Zigger as in the site and space and the mythology, as much as to a uh, Fergus Hanani study, uh, sorry, Mahara uh, Hanani studied with the director of Zenobia, who studied with the director of Omaya and trained in Moscow. And it's also, you know, you can see those um, references. Okay. Um, you concluded by stating that this work tells Omaya is a kind of a secularized Sufi, uh, become part of the national discourse. Yeah. The right. discourse. Yeah. Uh, you didn't go into that. But earlier you showed that small clip of the Sama of the solo well in Revish. Yeah. And you said it was a demonstration, so I understand the political demonstration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's what were they demonstrating against and how did that dance fit into the message of the demonstration? You know, I, I don't I don't have any sort of background unfortunately. No, because it seems to run in the opposite direction <laughs> of the conclusion itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, based on the, the, the flags, um, you know, that are shown at the demonstration in the which um, was a demonstration um, based on the architecture and you know, um, I'm reading it as much as any of us I think could read it. Um, uh, it looks like it's in a you know a square in European mm -hmm. city, um, so an outside within Syria. Um, um, you know, uh, so I actually think it, it might actually align um, with um, the projection of, of official culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So our third presenter this afternoon is uh, the guest comes in, and I'd like to introduce Michael o O'Toole uh, from University of Chicago, and uh, his topic is staging the sublime. Music and Islam on stage in uh, Germany. So we have that kind of cultural um, fusion in our conversation theme coming up in this presentation. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the other uh, members of the panel. Um, in Edmund Burke's A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful, published in 1756, Burke discusses several sources for the feeling of astonishment and fear that characterizes the power of the sublime. Alongside of terror, magnitude, vastness and loudness. Burke also includes infinity as a source of sublime feeling. Careful to point out that the perception of infinity is distinct from infinity itself, Burke describes the effects of infinity on the mind of an observer. Quote, infinity has a tendency to fill the mind with that sort of delightful horror, which is the most genuine effect and truest test of the sublime. There are scarce any things which can become the objects of our senses that are really, and in their own nature, infinite. But the eye not being able to perceive the bounds of many things, they seem to be different, and they produce the same effects as if they were really so." End quote. 
The German romantic painter Caspar David Friedrich's 1818 painting, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, seems to embody many aspects of Burke's description of the perception of infinity as a source of the sublime. A lone figure, his back turned towards the viewer, stands on a rocky outcrop looking out across a vast landscape stretching into the horizon. The solidity of a few rocky cliffs stand out against the impermanence of a sea of fog, which seems to blend imperceptibly with the sky above the large mountain in the distance. A viewer of the painting familiar with German geography would have no trouble identifying the location where the lone figure is standing. The sandstone mountains of Sächsische Schweiz, Saxon Switzerland, an area of eastern Germany that was a favorite subject for German painters in the Romantic era, and continues to be uh, a favorite hiking spot uh, along the German Czech border. The viewer's recognition of the landscape, that is someone looking at the painting, as one that really exists, that is not, in fact, as, um, as Burke pointed out, uh, infinite by its own quality, heightens the sense of identification with the figure looking out onto the landscape within the painting itself. The viewer looking at the painting looks in the same direction as the figure depicted, and can substitute the figure's perspective for his or her own. The viewer's sense of the infinite merges into the figure's sense of the infinite, creating a sense of absorption in the painting's subject. What happens to our perception of this landscape when the figure turns around to look at us, the viewers? The operatic tenor, uh, and I would like to argue that only an opera singer would be capable of such an image. Uh, and in fact, only an operatic tenor would be capable. Uh, a German no less. Jonas Kaufmann gave us a sense of what this might be like on the cover of his recording, Sehnsucht, a German word meaning longing, released in 2009 by Decca Records. <clears throat> With the figure's gaze directed back towards us, the illusion of infinity fades away. What Edmund Burke described as the delightful horror of being confronted with the vision of the infinite is here replaced by a pure assertion of the ego. Kaufmann is not, not lost in contemplation of the infinitude of nature, but boldly conquering it. With Kaufmann staring directly at us, the viewers, we can no longer substitute his gaze for ours. The image replaces Caspar David Friedrich's sense of being lost in a collective vision, with a feeling of multiple subjectivities and the artist as conquering hero. I would like to suggest that the transformation of perspectives in these two images point to a fundamental difficulty in considering the aesthetics of the sublime in relation to sacred music. Let's say the figure on the left in the Caspar David Friedrich painting represents a subject lost in contemplation of the divine, perhaps directing his or her energies towards God in a moment of prayer. When the subject turns around to face the viewer, presumably to convey the perspective gained through a contemplation of the infinite, the perception of infinity disappears. One perceives instead the ego of the subject and the limits of his or her ability to speak for the divine. Confronting the limits of one's ability to convey sacred experience and the challenge of relating one's ego or individuality to the infinity of the divine is an experience that is shared by many musicians who choose to foreground their faith as a central aspect of their artistry. This is perhaps especially true for musicians in the singer-songwriter genre, a tradition which foregrounds the individuality of personal experience and emphasizes the distinct uniqueness of one person's lyrical and musical voice. In this paper, I would like to uh, focus on and describe a little the music of Hulya Kandemir, a Turkish-German singer-songwriter who has made her Muslim faith and spirituality a central focus of her songwriting. Kandemir is perhaps best known in Germany not necessarily for her music, but for her 2005 autobiography, Himmelstochter, My Weg from Popstar to Allah, Daughter of Heaven, My Path from Popstar to Allah. In Daughter of Heaven, Kandemir describes her upbringing in a Turkish-German family in Bavaria, her early love of music, the development of her career as a singer-songwriter, her uh, 
continuing fascination for the guitar as an instrument of personal expression, and her spiritual journey that ultimately led her to intensify her commitment to Islam and begin wearing a headscarf. Kandemir's decision to wear a headscarf forms the central leitmotif of her autobiographical narrative, is a prominent feature of the book's cover, and became the most frequently commented upon aspect of the book in the German media coverage. Um, just one example of, a, of a, the kind of sensationalistic coverage that this uh, autobiography provoked is a headline by the name of uh, Kandemir replaces uh, pop with a headscarf. In an interview for the talk show, Matters of Faith, Kandemir described her autobiography as a narrative, quote, of my longing, of that pain, of the pain in me I carried with me a long time. I was searching and searching, and the aim and the end is, of course, to find the Islam and the faith and God, end quote. Uh, the talk show, Matters of Faith, it's uh, broadcast uh, by a satellite on every TV, um, it's also available on YouTube, and I surmise most of its viewers uh, watch it on YouTube. Kandemir's narrative of overcoming the pain and longing in her heart and finding relief in her faith is not unlike classic analyses of the sublime as the pleasure that arises from the removal or dissipation of pain. In Kina Vort's book, Musically Sublime, Vorth describes this aspect of the aesthetics of the sublime in a way that seems remarkably similar to narratives of religious conversion or awakening. Quote, and this is from Vorth's book, Musically Sublime, The sublime feeling often involves a negative moment of fright, frustration, or confusion. That is to say, a state of scattering, dispersal, that is relieved and finalized by a positive moment of mental relief or elevation. There is something that arrests the mind, but this arrest harbors its own release. The experience of fright or frustration screams a reversal in that it signals to the mind the possibility of its opposite." End quote. In the opening section of Daughter of Heaven, entitled Unruh, or Discomfort, Unease, Kandemir vividly describes such a negative moment of fright, frustration, and confusion leading up to and following a concert performance in Munich before she decided to wear a headscarf. Waiting backstage for the concert to begin, Kandemir describes her feeling of discomfort as she notices the sun beginning to set through her dressing room window. With only 10 minutes before the start of the concert, Kandemir worries about the reactions of her German bandmates as she asks them to leave the room so that she can perform her evening prayer. Uh, most of her band nights that night, as she describes, uh, were familiar with her, uh, with her um, prayer um, routines, uh, but there was a new member of the band that night, and she wasn't sure how he would react. Reflecting on the importance of prayer in her life, what she describes as her direct telephone line to Allah, she describes the feeling of calm that she experiences while praying before her appearance on stage. After finishing her prayers and making her way to the stage, however, her anxiety of discomfort returns. Describing the moment when she steps out onto the stage and hears the first cheers of the audience, she writes, Quote, it's a beautiful moment, and yet not my favorite, because it became increasingly overshadowed by darker thoughts. I didn't get nervous anymore like I used to, because I had long ago gotten accustomed to standing on stage. It was no longer a thrill, but a routine that I increasingly questioned. Why did people put me on a pedestal? Why did they love my voice and my music, but not recognize the true longing that hid behind my songs? Why did they feel my rhythms and melodies, but not my love of God?" End quote. Returning home both physically and mentally exhausted after the concert, Kam Demir goes on to describe the feeling of calm that returned to her after she completed her nighttime prayer. I quote again from the opening section. As I stood up from my prayer, I felt exhausted, as if after a great physical exertion. That was clearly not just my tiredness after the concert. It was also the calm after the inner storm that had raged through me. My thoughts finally calmed down. I became empty, and at the same time, I felt an infinite peace flowing through me." End quote. It was at this moment of infinite peace that Kandemir made her decision to wear a headscarf, a decision that she knew would be difficult for her to reconcile with her public appearances as a musician. Coupled with Kandemir's decision to wear a headscarf, was her decision to dedicate her songwriting more explicitly 
to expressing her faith and spirituality. In the song, Who, for instance, she constructs the refrain of the song around the repetition of Who, one of the names of God that is ritually repeated in the practice of Zikr. In her performance of Who, and I'll uh, play a performance uh, just in a moment, she ends the verses, which this is from her first English language album, which I'll describe in a bit. She ends the verses that, with words that rhyme with who, such as you, do, and the English inter interrogative pronoun who, eliding these words seamlessly into the recitation of who as the name of God. So this is again from the uh, interview show Matters of Faith. Incidentally, it's hosted uh, here by Christiana Bacher. Uh, she was uh, one of the first uh, MTV DJs for the uh, European broadcast of MTV, uh, which at that time was European wide rather than uh, just in Germany. She is German herself. That was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, in the 90s, she converted to Islam. Um, she stepped out of her role as a, a, a broadcaster for a little bit, um, and now she's returning to it, focusing on uh, matters of faith. So she's uh, at this moment asking Julia to perform a song for the show. In 2014, Condemir released her first English language album, Ego, on the UK-based label Andante Records. Andante Records was founded and is directed by Sami Yusuf, a British musician who has become one of the most well-known singers of Islamic devotional popular music in the English language. The artists represented on Andante Records, including Yusuf and Condemir, are part of a generation of young Muslim musicians in Europe who are committed to representing their faith and spirituality through the musical idioms of Western popular music. The cover of Ego depicts Cara Demir staring out at the viewer. 
her long hair billowing up behind her as if she has just turned towards the viewer. For Kottenberg's audience and those familiar with her career in Germany, the image on the cover of Ego made a significant impact for precisely what is missing. Kondemir's long flowing hair in place of the headscarf that she wore for several years and that donned the cover of Heaven's Daughter. That she also had made a, into a significant aspect of her image as a musician and as an advocate for Muslims in Germany. Kondemir has not addressed um, in very much detail her uh, decision uh, to no longer wear the headscarf. Uh, in a press statement accompanying the release of Ego, uh, Kondemir's decision is attributed to her continuing spiritual journey and growth. I quote from the press release, She doesn't need it anymore, because for her it's not a matter of outward appearances. What's important to her is inner worth. End quote. The simplicity of the album cover and Kondemir's direct gaze toward the viewer draw on a broader iconography of the singer-songwriter genre, as one that establishes a direct and honest communication between the musician and the listener. The sonic signifiers of this honesty and intimacy are well known to listeners of the singer-songwriter genre. close mic vocals that allow the listener to hear the inhalation and exhalation of the vocalist's breath, sparse instrumentation that highlights and amplifies the voice without subsuming it, and a lyrical emphasis on simple, direct, first-person statements of personal experience. And this is a song uh, from this album uh, called I Can't Stop Loving You. Every time I pray What a miracle I got into your way Every time I pray It's so magical special kind of clay I can stop loving you You, 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 you I can stop loving you You, 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 you Never stop loving you You, 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 you you're the only one, only one is you. Every time I pray, you get to let a life carry me away. Every time I pray, there's just your love I can only say. I can stop loving you, 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 you. I can stop loving you, 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 you. Never stop loving you You, 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 you You're the only one Only one is you I can stop loving you I'd like to conclude by returning to the two images with which I began this presentation um, and to ask the question of how it might help us to understand um, this song, I Can't Stop Loving You, in relation to the aesthetics of the sublime and how that might relate to the question of agency and collectivity in sacred music, especially in such a personal genre as the singer-songwriter genre. I'd like to argue that um, well, first of all, uh, this is a, a theme, and I can't stop loving you. It draws on a theme that recurs frequently in Kondemir's music. Her love of prayer and the deep sense of calm and purpose it gives her. Kondemir conveys this love of prayer by framing the song itself, I think, as a prayer that gradually transitions into a song. By beginning the song with her voice alone, she draws attention 
to the individuality of her relationship with God through prayer, and her sense of absorption and rapture in prayer. Every time I pray, what a miracle, I dive into your way. Um, there's a sense in which the listener um, shares, can share the uh, perspective of Condemir as she is performing this prayer in her song. But I think the one thing that Condemir is grappling with in this song and throughout this album is how to translate that feeling of rapture in prayer, as can be visualized in, in Friedrich's painting, into a form of public address that is directed towards an audience, without, that is to say, adopting the conquering triumphalism of the ego that Jonas Kaufmann has decided to represent in his particular recording. This is a transformation that is difficult for any artist to affect. For Condemir, it is a question of negotiating her own relationship to her ego. Um, and as the name of the album suggests, that's a significant theme uh, throughout all of the songs in the album. It's a difficult task since her role as an artist, particularly as a singer-songwriter, is to draw on and represent her own personal experiences as an aspect of emotions that are shared, perhaps collectively. I would like to suggest in conclusion that Condemir stages this transformation from ego to, co to collectivity in the musical development of I Can't Stop Loving You. Specifically, she stages a transformation from the single individual voice directed in prayer to God to a collective subjectivity represented by the introduction of instrumental accompaniment, piano, and strings to her solitary voice. The instruments functioning as a chorus support and amplify Condemir's voice and encourage the listener to imagine her own voice added to Condemir's. This staging of amplification is an important aspect of Edmund Burke's own theorization of the role of sound as a source of sublime power. And I would like to conclude just with some, um, a citation of Burke's words on uh, the role of sound in the aesthetics of the sublime. Um, in the section Sound and Loudness. The eye is not the only organ of sensation by which a sublime passion may be produced. Sounds have a great power in these as in most other passions. I do not mean words because words do not affect simply by their sounds, but by means altogether different. Excessive loudness alone is sufficient to overpower the soul, to suspend its action, and to fill it with terror. The noise of vast cataracts, raging storms, thunder, or artillery awakes a great and awful sensation in the mind, though we can observe no nicety or artifice in these sorts of music. The shouting of multitudes has a similar effect. And by the sole strength of the sound so amazes and confounds the imagination, that in this staggering and hurry of the mind, the best established tempers can scarcely forbear being borne down and joining in the common cry and common resolution of the crowd. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any uh, questions? audience. Um, do you want to choose your question? Yes, Phil. Thanks, Michael. That was, that was really interesting. Really good. Um, I, want, I want you to add a little bit, take your, your, your final concluding um, ideas a little bit farther by thinking about the fact that album covers, mm -hmm. are the design of album covers don't come from the artists themselves, mm -hmm. as opposed to the book. Um, which, is, which is a very different, in which one often makes the choices mm. oneself. So, so there's the, so my thought is that there's also a kind of a collective, in other words, that reinterpretation of Friedrich from, from the, the, with the, the Jonas Kaufmann mm. album, already considering the viewer, but not really Kaufmann, in that sense. And, and how does that, so, so in other words, the ego, it's, it's not so much um, Condemir's ego, perhaps, and I'm, I'm, I'm not making this conclusion, but I wonder if you would take yours a little bit further, but rather an understanding of what we understand, like the listener, the buyer, the consumer, thinks of as a collective ego when it comes to, to questions of religion and performance. Um, I think part of the way of thinking about her representation on the CD cover is to think of it in the context of the Andante Records catalog. Mm -hmm. um, and 
specifically the way in which um, first some use of the, the founder of the of the record company, and then in terms of his um, promotion and kind of gathering together a group of like-minded uh, devotional musicians, um, that there is an emphasis on the individuality of the person seeing. Uh, and that individuality includes that person's body and that person's appearance to the world. Um, and this is something which differentiates, uh, let's say, the, 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 the type of devotional music that Sami Yusuf and Hulia Kandamir practice, um, and forms of devotional music that have a lot of devotional popular music that have a long history, for example, in Turkey, in which um, one hardly ever sees the image of a face or the singer on the cover of a devotional popular music album in Turkey. Um, it's, uh, the covers are usually a generic picture of a rose or a mosque, um, with the idea that the individuality of the performer is less important than the kind of collective identity of that performer's um, kind of religious expression. Um, I think also in terms of thinking about the, the, um, um, the use of the word ego, um, as the title. She does have a song called Ego on the album. She stages it as a dialogue between herself and her ego. Uh, she represents the ego as a man, and in interviews she makes a very specific argument that her ego is a masculine voice, um, that, um, that she considers um, partly uh, um, a voice related to the prophet, um, related to an idea of, of a masculine divinity, um, but also a sense that she has to differentiate herself in some way. Um, she describes a moment of looking into uh, a mirror and seeing a man's face reflected back that she visualizes as her ego and collapsing to the floor and praying to Allah to help her resolve this conundrum. Um, not all of those details are in the song itself. Um, that comes from her explanation in, in an interview. Um, but um, I, I would kind of be on the path towards suggesting that you know, the very multiplicity of ideas of the ego is part of the intention. Um, and the fact that um, it can't be necessarily tied down to any one specific meaning. Yes? Yeah, actually, just to take this conversation a bit further, because you actually uh, concluded that her challenge was to translate the rapture she feels yes. inwardly. Uh, into a form of public address, you know, the same intention uh, in a performance. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, of course the conference is about music, but I was wondering if you would not touch some very central issue here on this whole controversy about hijab and feminine beauty. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, in a sense, when she, she when you describe the own you know, mm -hmm. discomfort when she first went on stage, it seems to me that you're saying that she wants the attention to be focused on the meaning and the transcendence of yep. the singing rather than on her as a person. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, it's it like almost she's going back. But you could look at it in another way uh, that actually, you know, maybe her, she's trying to say that maybe my, she's no longer so uncomfortable with people looking at her so long as the beauty is a signifier of some greater beauty. Mm -hmm. See, because like Philip says that, you know, I mean, he's right that. Even the book cover is very often determined by the publisher, and not by. But if she, but normally they would not overwrite the preference of the artist or the author, mm -hmm. so if they would not have done it without her permission. Right. So then, how do you explain this decision and her own reticence in not wanting to explain the seeming mm -hmm. retrogressive move? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very important way of looking at this whole issue of the hijab and the beauty, kind of beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 at least in, in the, um, her representation of her decision in the beginning of uh, Heaven's Daughter, um, she does not link it very specifically with ideas of feminine beauty um, or of her own um, um, femininity. Um, she describes it as an effort to tie down the meaning of her songs. Um, she has a songwriting style that expresses itself in um, um, where the language of romantic love um, expresses her sense of devotional love for God and the prophet. Um, and she experiences a, a, a conflict that the meaning of that is not tied down. Uh, and rather than addressing that in, by, by tying down specific words, which she doesn't want to do, 
Um, she frames her uh, wearing of the hijab as a, uh, a way of specifying the meaning of what she is singing for her audience and for people who might not have been in her audience but she wanted to attract. Um, she also says that before she wore the hijab in her concerts, um, it was mostly a German audience. After she started wearing the hijab, um, there were more Turks in the audience. Uh, there were more members of the Muslim community in the audience. Um, Again, she has not provided as much explicit detail about the long flowing hair that she now is displaying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it opens up the meanings again. Um, and it opens up the meanings, I think, in, in interesting ways. Um, and I think represents, well, she's, she's tied it to um, you know, her sense of being comfortable with herself and in what she's saying, but she doesn't need to have her meanings tied down anymore by other people. So the reason I look at it that way is because in Indian context, mm -hmm. The hair is very much tied up with the decision because the first thing a person does when she renounces, she or he renounces, they cut the hair. Mm. So, you know, it's mm. not pretty glaring for somebody to come There's no question that her, her decision to wear the veil in Germany uh, made her the object of persecution in public. Uh, that's just a, 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 a daily feature of, of um, wearing the veil in public in Germany. Um, so, there's the whole dimension of uh, how it changed her. I, uh, identity in public as well, which um, I haven't addressed, and and, and um, I need to look more into um, her whole career to, to start to understand. She wore the veil, or just the hijab? Uh, she just wore the hijab, and she's very specific. Um, so the question is, who is the audience of Daughter's Heaven, uh, or Heaven's Daughter? And uh, she very much uh, writes the book for an audience that presumably is not familiar with Islam and is not familiar with the symbolism of veiling. Um, she's very specific that um, she chose to wear a hijab and not cover anything more, and that's all that um, she needs to do to be a Muslim, and doing more is exaggeration, which um, is not a very good Islamic quality. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry that we um, I need to move to the last presentation and we'll really be throwing ourselves off uh, for the rest of the day because as it is, we are cutting into the break. So I'll let the, the uh, organizers decide how we're going to manage that. For now, we're going to hear the last of our uh, uh, four presentations this afternoon. And uh, as our uh, uh, speakers are switching out their uh, computers, I'd like to introduce our final speaker today, and that is Lauren Osborne, uh, a religious studies at uh, Whitman College, yes. a graduate of the University of Chicago. Yes. And uh, she will be speaking on locating experience and emotion in the recited Quran. Thank you. Just yeah. one second. Yeah. Everybody has different kinds of computers and sockets that have to go in. It's our break, so I'll try to keep it really lively, and I'll keep my pace brisk. Um, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to Professors Horatio, Bolman, Sells for inviting me to take part in this wonderful conversation today, and of course Nora for all her hard work for plugging me into, you know, this sense and the greater sense as well. Um, so I'll be wrapping up our panel by speaking about the most sublime sound of them all, the recited Quran. I say that like half in jest. Um, this presentation grows out of a portion of my research, um, which in a whole, my research in a whole, I seek to address different modes of meaning in the recited Quran, looking at meaning in a literary aesthetic sense on one hand in terms of poetics, through rhyme and rhythm. On the other hand, this is a many-handed project. Um, and the use of pitch and melody via the maqamat, the modes of Arabic music. Then the piece I'll be talking about today 
um, is about what I call non-discursive meaning in the recited Quran. So completely apart from all of those things that I just described, just to let you know. I'm aware of those things. I talk about them elsewhere. I'm focusing on this one thing today. So I'm by referring to non-discursive meaning in the recited Quran, what I'm talking about is emotion and affect on the part of reciters and listeners. Um, so in my presentation today, I ask how we may understand the meaning of the recited Quran on the level of experience. And in doing so, I'm casting an intentionally very broad net in order to highlight the variety of possibilities and the variety, the multiple layers of context or the kinds of things we can call context that are contributing to recite, the recited Quran. Um, and I'm doing this um, not only owing a great methodological debt to Professor Qureshi, but also treating this as a foundation for continued research as well, which is why I'm as broad as possible. So in doing this, I'm suggesting that while Quran recitation is on one hand a highly regulated ritual activity, right? There's all these rules, all the adab about your behavior, the rules of pronunciation, pausing, so on and so forth. So it's, it's highly regulated on that level, obviously the text being fixed. Um, by understanding it more, more broadly as performance through process, this shows us that many of the expectations for how the Quran, the recited Quran is understood and or heard are more culturally and historically contingent than we may have initially assumed. And finally, bringing this back down to the level of individual experience, the approach I take here complicates traditional theories of emotion and affect in religious ritual with respect to this implied dichotomy of interior experience and exterior factors impacting that on the level of emotion, experience, and the self um, in terms of both performers and listeners. So my sources here include historical aesthetic studies of the Quran and then interviews that I've conducted with reciters um, in this presentation, I draw on two interviews with reciters both in North America. So much of what they say pertains primarily to the North American context, although my research more generally is not limited to that context. I consider this information in light of theories of performance um, from a, a range of disciplines, ethnomusicology, anthropology, of course, folklore, so on and so forth. Um, other scholarship on the recited Quran, of course, and recent works on the role of emotion in emotion and ritual in Islam, and then recent works on listening cultures and similar studies making up this burgeoning field of sensory studies. So in doing this, I argue that theories of performance emphasizing process are helpful not only in considering the wide range of possibilities for how Quranic recitation may occur, but also in their broad conceptualizations of multiple layers of context. And most importantly, by bringing the role of the listener and listening cultures back into the conversation, which have typically been largely absent from a lot of the scholarship on the recited Quran. In doing so, I consider recitation as an emergent phenomenon involving collaboration between performer and audience, trying to break down that dichotomous structure, and asking about the how of Quran recitation in order to draw out a sense of process and this multiplicity of determining factors. So in considering the recited Quran in this way, a number of questions immediately arise about what exactly we're talking about when we talk about the recited Quran. Where are we hearing this? Where are we reciting this? What's going on? Um, so what's the context of recitation, or what is the occasion? For example, are we talking about a single individual in prayer? Are we talking about a group of students attending recitation classes at a mosque, children, adults? Um, are we talking about a reciter being asked to recite a passage before a varied audience at a, like an interfaith event or some kind of like public outreach at a mosque or Islamic center, which is something that both of the individuals I interview in here refer to. Um, this kind of event being very specific to the North American context, right, is a part of an effort to educate non-Muslims about the Quran and what it sounds like. Um, back to these questions. Uh, so what is the content? Like, how is a reciter choosing what passage they're going to recite? And what does it sound like? And then who is the listener? This is, of course, very directly related to context and occasion. So who's present? Or is there a listener, even, right? If we're talking about one person in a room, they could be both reciter and listener. Um, and then what are the contextual factors that may contribute to the actual act or moment of reciting or of listening? 
Alternatively, we may look to changing attitudes and discourse surrounding the understanding of the recited Quran and what it should sound like. Um, for example, I address this in another part of my research where I talk about the changing preferences and aesthetics um, vis-a-vis -vis the use of the maqamat, those uh, modes of Arabic music. So the use of pitch and melody having changed a great deal in the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and then finally, what about the role of recordings? So what about if we imagine a shopkeeper playing a CD of recitation within his bookshop, or what about an individual finding recordings online? Like Barty, I wish I had more time to go into the commodification aspect of this, because it's an incredibly rich question that I don't have time for to talk about today, but would love to. Um, so one way in which I've tried to situate the recited Quran is by asking reciters and listeners about their preferences for writing, reciting and listening. What passages they like to recite best or they like to listen to best, depending on context, of course. So for example, Fatima, a reciter I interviewed who is from Saudi Arabia and has been residing temporarily in the US, she recites for a great variety of occasions. And talking about her preferred surah to recite, she cites different factors driving her preferences. Preferences and constraints, as you'll see. One of these is content. So um, in response to my question about what surahs or what passages she might prefer, she went immediately to a response that I hear very, very often, which is surah to Rahman. Right? Of course, this surah has a very distinctive rhyme pattern as well, which I talk about in another portion of my research, and that's certainly a contributing factor to the, this as a common response. It has this incredibly persistent rhyme pattern, and it's unique in the Quran in that way. Well, rhyme, of course, occurring a lot in the Quran, but the kind of rhyme in Surah Rahman being a very special variety. Um, there are also issues related to the style of the Surah that she draws on in responding to my question. She expresses a preference for shorter verses as well. And she cites Surah al Mu'minun in particular as being a Surah with shorter verses that she enjoys to recite expanding a bit to explain in this quotation. And I should note that my spoken Arabic and her spoken English are both sort of at a moderate level, and so this interview is kind of arab easy and it's, it's a little, it's, it's difficult to edit. <laughs> so it sounds a little awkward, but that's, that's why. So she says, when the surah has short verses, it's easier to recite. You recite one verse, you take a breath, you pause, you take a breath, and you recite the next verse. It's just easier to recite. So usually people who can hold their breath for a longer time, like Kosarim and Shawi, they can recite the whole verse, even if it's two or three lines, without a break, which is really hard. So alongside her preferences related to content being the message of mercy in Surah Al-Rahman, and she mentions the variety of topics in Surah Al-Mu'minun, she cites stylistic concerns insofar as they relate to considerations of the body, in this case, breath control, so particular constraints in that regard, and techniques of reciting, such as having to make decisions about causes in verse. Abdullah, another reciter from North America, who I've interviewed, describes a number of factors that may impact his choice of passage or surah for performance. These factors often depending on relations between discursive or content of the text on one hand and the occasion or context, and then related to that, of course, the audience who's likely to be in attendance at that particular event. He says, there are some passages in the Quran that are very legal. For example, sections dealing with inheritance laws. You'll rarely find that at a public performance, a Qari, a reciter, is reciting that. And even if you go to the mosque for prayer, it's rare that somebody recites a bit like that. Whereas if somebody reads from Surah Al-Rahman, again, it resonates with people. It calms people down after a long day of work. So later in this same interview, he hit some of these same points again and put it in a slightly different way, more clearly identifying the subject matter of Surah Rahman as being, making it a likely choice for recitation. If a reciter's picking something to recite, they're not going to pick a random section from Surah Anisat dealing with inheritance laws. They're going to pick a section like the end of Furqan that has general inspirational guidance, or a section from Surah Rahman that celebrates the mercy and the bounties of God, things like that. So Abdullah then frames the reciter's choice of subject matter in relation to audience in terms of preference for a certain type of theme or topic within the text. So subject matter, the words themselves, right, still being a very large determining factor in this case. And he also points to the opposite at the same time, right, material from which a reciter might shy away for recitation in a particular context. 
So here he begins by describing this type of event I mentioned earlier that is very specific to North America, where a reciter might be asked to perform before an audience primarily of non-Muslims in order to demonstrate like what the recited Quran sounds like to sort of showcase its beauty. Um, he says, there are sections in the Quran, this is, he, this is in the context of him telling me about this particular kind of event, there are sections in the Quran that a lay person might find problematic without additional context or information or so on. And especially in reciting to a non-Muslim audience, you're a little more aware of that. Essentially, it would be unlikely for a reciter to choose a passage that they think may offend a non-Muslim audience or that they may find problematic, as he puts it. And contrastingly, a passage on God's punishment of unbelievers, for example, would be inappropriate for an audience comprised of Muslims, he says. So if there's a whole chapter dealing with punishment for unbelievers, it's unlikely that in a Quran recitation gathering that that's going to be recited. It's not of the utmost relevance to that context. So as Abdullah and Fatima highlight quite clearly with these examples, a reciter's choice of passage is influenced a great deal by their understanding of the context and occasion and relatedly audience for whom they're going to be reciting um, at that particular event. Additionally, however, Abdullah points to larger social conventions and the role of listening cultures in impacting individuals' choices for both reciting and listening. And this is where I'm trying to bring listeners back in here into the conversation. These factors work alongside expectations and preferences regarding subject matter, but are not always directly in conversation with the words of the text themselves. So, for example, he mentions that there's these verses from Surah Darun that are often recited at weddings, them being a common choice because they mention God having created spouses from among humanity as a sign. So, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجُ لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةَ وَرَحْمَةَ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِكَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So, among his signs, it is that he created spouses from among you so that you may reside in it, and he put love and mercy between you. There are signs in that for people who consider it. So these, this is a verse that you would commonly hear recited at a wedding. So, but as Abdullah goes on to explain to me in this interview, this verse, um, when taken alone out of context of its surah or surrounding verses, this is appropriate material for a wedding, right? It's talking about spouses, pairs of people, signs from God. Um, if we take it within the context of surah or room more generally, it may seem a little bit less appropriate for the context of a wedding. So this is in very, very broad strokes here, but Surat al-Rum is often read as addressing the rise and fall of empires, such as the Persian defeat of the Byzantines, which the second verse of the Surah is usually read as referring to, within the context of um, human history and God's ordering of time and the universe. It's not all particularly inspirational material for the context of a wedding. But nevertheless, these, this verse talking about spouses is, is typically read at weddings. So what's going on here? First, the verse on its own, it is appropriate, right? So we, we can kind of take it from its context and use it in this way. It is one of the verses of the Quran, that's perfectly fine. But secondly, the and perhaps more importantly, the custom of reciting this passage at weddings also gains momentum through its repetition. So this is something that we our, our attention is drawn to only by understanding performance quite broadly in this way, where previous performances become indexed as part of a specific performance. So these the verse might come to be recited commonly at weddings because it is recited commonly at weddings. This is the verse that is expected and it sort of gains momentum through repetition in that way. So the issue of habits and preferences in recitation and listening, it's, it's obviously complex. The way in which preferences of listeners comes up in my interviews bears consideration in light of conceptions of performance that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, and more recent research on listening cultures. So for example, when asked about her favorite reciters, Fatima expresses a preference for the older Egyptian reciters. And this, I've kind of broken the quote down here to try to break up the monstrosity of text on PowerPoint slides, for which I apologize for my terrible PowerPoint etiquette. She says, I listen to Hosari and also Minshawi. They repeat a lot. Their recitations are really strong and clear. There are a few others, a lot of them recite, like Alephasi. And this came up because we were 
uh, just previously to her saying this, we were talking about Ella Fassi, who's a very well-known current reciter from Kuwait City, um, who's very stylistically in terms of like, also again, commodification and presentation, very typical of these um, Gulf region reciters right now. Very different from those Egyptian classics from the mid-20th century. So, um, sorry, I'm interrupting her quotation. Going on, uh, a lot of them recite like Alec Bassi. He recites in a good way, but I prefer the old school better than the new ones. They recite slowly. Their pronunciation of the letters is more clear. They don't make any mistakes. The new ones, lots of them recite fast, and they have their own records, which for me disturbs the real roots. I prefer the classic ones, and of course the voice. Their voice tones are nice. You know when reciting the Quran, it's not just the rules, it's also how beautiful is the voice. It's personal, you know? Some people prefer something else over others. The same thing for reciters. So here, Fatima cites a whole range of reasons, right? Driving her preferences as a listener. First, she places a high emphasis on clarity, particularly through repetition and pace. It's true, those newer Gulf reciters tend to recite very, very quickly. If you look at just the length of one of their recordings of like one surah compared to one of these Egyptian reciters, even when they're reciting in the Maratel style, you know, there's a difference of like several minutes. They're, they recite very fast now. Um, she also expresses a view that the high degree of commercialization typical of Alephasi and similar reciters right now um, is at odds with what she views as authenticity, right? The real roots, as she put it, of the recited Quran. She also mentions the beauty of the voice, but goes on to add, um, to sort of hedge, that preferences of beauty uh, are personal. So I'm going to focus on that last point a little bit here. So while preferences regarding beauty and vocal quality are in part personal, like she says, it's worth noting that the two reciters she named for me as being two of her favorites, Hosari and Minshawi, these are not exactly uncommon choices. If you've ever Googled for like the recited Quran or talked to anybody about it, you've probably heard about these guys, right? A lot of people like them. And partly this does attest to the quality of their voices and recitations. They are really good. They have nice voices. But there are other social historical factors at play that are worth addressing here. So first, how can we think about the role of the listener then in these, in these choices? So in considering Quranic recitation this broadly, a conceptualization of performance that includes the listener is useful, signaling in a very important point. There's not a straightforward dichotomy when we understand Quran recitation this broadly, or really many other modes of performance this broadly. There's not a dichotomy necessarily between performer on one hand and audience or listener on the other, sender or recipient, right? Performance is not all like the kind of thing I'm doing for you now, me standing up here talking and you sitting there receiving what I'm saying. That's not always the paradigm that we need when we're talking about performance. So when we understand it broadly in a way that includes the listener as participant, um, this does not always consist of actions performed before passive spectators or passive listeners, right? The ways in which people listen and shape or understand the material to which they listen and the act of listening itself, listening practices, these are all historically and culturally contingent. So this point emerges in my research through these interviews with reciters and listeners. As I noted previously, while Fatima does cite as a driving factor for her own listening, her personal preference in terms of what a reciter's voice sounds like, the reciters and sources that she mentions are very common choices for the present moment. Um, an individual's listening preferences may also be shaped by their own personal history and previous experiences reciting and listening, as Abdullah stated in response to my question. When I was small, I used to listen to a cassette of this certain section, and I always like it now. Sometimes there's not that much thought put into it. It's just, you heard a good recitation of it a long time ago. So like Sura Yusuf, for example. For a long time ago, I had a, for a long time I had a CD of Sheikh Mutawalli reciting Sura Yusuf, and I just like it because of that. It's just there with me that I used to listen to a lot. Surat al-Khujarat, for example, that's a favorite for me in terms of its meaning, but also when I was a kid, we had a cassette, and it was just a nice recitation. So one point that emerges from these examples is that there's, of course, not one way in which people engage with the recited Quran, neither as reciters nor as listeners. So the quotations from these interviews that I've highlighted here show a number of possibilities for reciting and listening, how we might understand this in terms of context and contributing factors, right? So a small Quran recitation group, a mosque of prayers, a community event such as a wedding, a broader public event such as reciting for an audience of varied 
religious backgrounds, um, or via recordings, of course, on a variety of media. So with this range of possible encounters in mind, um, there are a number of complex, there's a complex network of interrelated factors at work in determining what any particular performance may look and sound like. So ultimately, an understanding of this network of factors as such, and how they may determine the shape of the recitation may give us a fuller picture of the possibilities for contextual impact on that moment of recitation. So while recitation is in itself um, a highly structured religious ritual, right, like I mentioned at the beginning, with precise rules dictating how it must be done, and expectations for purity, etiquette, adab, pronunciation, so on and so forth, um, the ways in which people make choices about listening to recitation and reciting, these, many of these factors are more historically and culturally dependent than is often recognized. So a detailed uh, consideration of listeners and listening cultures of the recited Quran quickly reveals that there's not a single archetype of a listener to the Quran, nor is there an archetype of how one listens to the Quran, right? There's not one mode of listening. Um, no. Nothing demonstrates this more clearly, I think, than um, some of the accounts from the early tradition, which Naveed Karmani deals with in Gautas Shun, which Professor Goldman mentioned earlier today. Um, Karmani reports, brings many of these reports of people um, in the Prophet's milieu <coughs> hearing the recited Quran and fainting, weeping, even dying, or in the cases of some detractors reacting with like extreme rage in the face of its power. Right? These are not the sort of practices that we think of very commonly when we think about people listening or reacting to the recited Quran like right now in the 21st century. Right? Um, so that difference can highlight for us really the, the contrast. There's not, there's not one way in which the recited Quran should be received. Um, rather, individuals listen from and with reference to their particular circumstances, both personal circumstances, like Abdullah talking about how he used to have this cassette that he really likes as a kid, or more broadly culturally and historical circumstances, right, that contribute to the act of listening. So by understanding a recited Quran as a performance that takes place through process, broadly understanding context on multiple levels, we may include the listener and listening cultures in our understanding of the practice itself, rather than focusing on the reciter and the performance more narrowly defined. So to return in conclusion to my opening remarks about the role of emotion in Quran recitation. My discussion in this presentation, like I mentioned, complicates this interior-exterior dichotomy that we normally assume might be implied when we're talking about emotion um, with respect to traditional theories of emotion and affect, particularly with regard to religious ritual. So traditional theories of emotion and religious ritual have seen ritual as a space for conventional emotion rather than genuine where an emotion is channeled through and or confined strictly to the ritual context defined quite narrowly. So here I'm drawing particularly on recent work from Saba Mahmoud and her discussion of Stanley Tambaya and Victor Turner. In her article, Mahmoud's article that is, Rehearsed Spontaneity and the Conventionality of Ritual Disciplines of Salat, Mahmoud speaking specifically about Kyrie women's participation in prayer in the mosque movement in Egypt, um, she argues that these women's understanding of the practice in that space is not separate for daily life. She argues as follows. The conscious process by which the mosque participants induced sentiments and desires in themselves in accordance with a moral ethical program simultaneously problematizes the naturalness of emotions as well as the conventionality of ritual action, calling into question any a priori distinction between formal conventional behavior and spontaneous intentional conduct. So similarly to what Mahmoud is saying here, my discussion of Quran recitation may serve to break down the paradigm of emotion and ritual as confined to that space and confined to that moment, uh, as shown not only by the diversity of listening cultures and contexts associated with the recited Quran, but also with the range of broader influences shaping recitation for both reciters and listeners. So while Fatima, uh, for example, Frames some of her preferences as being personal, right? She, some people just prefer some things over the others. It's personal. I argue here that those preferences are best understood within the broader context of the culture and history within which they occur. Thank you. Um, uh, can I uh, invite the uh, 
audience for any questions? Yes. I said that sounds formulated as well, but it's very provocative and material. And, um, I'm thinking about you know, how we often think about what we say is informed by the prior utterances of others about to you. Right? Mm -hmm. But our listening is also informed by the prior listening mm -hmm. practices of others. And then the, the affect, it, it, it's interesting that um, if there's any mention of genuine versus spontaneous or intentional. It's like, who is intention? Yeah. Because for me, what listening problematizes is precisely this. Is this notion of subject, which is uh, separate. So, yeah, affect theory, if you're, if you're reading Teresa Brennan, uh -huh. we're all, um, we're all together. So, you know, if somebody, if lights went out or if something happened, we would all have a collective gasp <laughs> and, you know, and responding to, together, just as we're all responding to your, if you're listening, yeah. to your, <laughs> <laughs> your <laughs> together. So, where is where is the assertion of the individual here? I, mean, I don't know that there's ever an answer to that question, but yeah, no, I think what may address your or maybe begin to address your question in part is the way I came to all of this stuff. So when I first started this research, I was like, okay, we're going to think about non-discursive meaning for studying Quran. I had this idea that it would be. Um, the emotion in like a very narrowly defined sense. Like, how do you feel when you were like, you know, Surah Rahman, it calms me, right? I was thinking about sort of emotion and interiority in a very like Protestant sense, as being contained within oneself, like a sort of William James paradigm of religious experience. And what I found was actually much more broad. Like, occasionally people would say, like, yeah, Surah Rahman calms me, right? It's got this rhyme, the message is about mercy, so on and so forth. But, like, all these other things kind of kept butting in, like, and that just began to highlight for me, I think, how I really needed to address this question of, like, okay, what are we even talking about when we talk about the recited Quran? Like, there's so many different things that we could be referring to, and I guess, I, in a sense, I had to deal with that, and sort of, it sort of, it completely broke down this, the individual for me, so I, I've gotten very, very far from that, but I, I mean, that's still there, I'm just not sure how to deal with it, the individual emotional paradigm. It's a question. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's a very good question. Oh, yeah, Tim. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I am interested to see the portion you said is elsewhere in your research about um, commodification and uh, consumption. Oh, commodification, um, no, that's, that's something I have to talk about, but that's not in my dissertation yet. Oh, no, okay, yeah. well, no, all right. Um, and and um, I was struck by, uh, maybe this will be useful, but I was struck by um, the permanence of consumer goods as recitation when you talked about um, what a particular uh, reciter had heard in childhood. Yeah. Um, which so often we think of, you know, the the temporary and, and the wastefulness of uh, ceaseless consumption, but in, in a sense of recitation, it's permanent in that one can hear the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Um, the, the question I have is, um, do particular reciters um, in uh, any way see themselves similarly or different to other kinds of performers in that they do live in a music in which pop, uh, they do live in a world in which pop music is all around? Do they see themselves uh, similarly or differently because the medium is the same. Yeah, um, it totally depends on the individual and the particular context, I think. Like, I'm thinking on one hand of Alephasi, the Kuwaiti reciter that I mentioned earlier. He has this, like, whole extensive web presence everywhere, so he's very well known as a reciter. You can go on his YouTube station and see all these videos of him reciting at prayers at the Grand Mosque in Kuwait City, but um, he also sings like he has all these um sort of popular devotional songs as well and these like music videos for them on his youtube station as well um so certainly for him that's like perfectly fine but um i'm filling in the blanks a little bit here but abdullah the reciter that i cited quite a bit in this presentation um he we also spoke in this interview about um changing views about styles of recitation, particularly the Mujawa versus Muratal, like how extensively one um, draws on the use of musical modes and uh, like melodic affect in the recitation. So I guess 
I don't think of recordings then as being all that permanent because people's preferences and what they listen to change, right? So while those like really melodically foreign Mujawad recitations all recorded of Egyptians mid 20th century, while those were tremendously popular, they're not as popular anymore. You don't hear as much talk about them. That's not to say that no one's listening to it or no one's reciting in that way. It's still very much around, but what you tend to hear much more is this very fast-paced, more adult style. So although those recordings persist, like people's change, people's preferences change a great deal over time. It's, it's very different. Uh, a, a CD owner versus a radio listener that yeah, you know yeah. that uh, effect will be very different. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, just one. Well, I, I mean, it's your, your, yours is the next session. Yeah, we, we have time for I just one. wanted to make an announcement, uh, actually. Oh, okay, uh, great. Make an announcement. Uh, since uh, uh, there be, um, uh, Nafi Karamadi's work has been mentioned a couple times, yeah. it happens to be, be uh, uh, the situation that he is in Chicago and will be speaking, well, I, he's either in Chicago or will be arriving soon, and will be speaking at the Goethe Institute, um, uh, I believe on Monday and Tuesday. Um, I think most of his discussions will be in German, of course, um, at the Goethe Institute, but he may have some uh, discussions in English, and so, I would just go to the uh, Goethe Institute in uh, Chicago and see what is scheduled. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.